Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your warm welcome since we've gotten here. Uh, the welcome has been such that I feel like I'm in Africa because <laughs> uh, we've, ha we've had great company, we've had great food, uh, and we've had very lively conversations. I'm going to, I, I, uh, I feel so full from listening to everybody since uh, Ophabia started yesterday, and I'm very grateful uh, to, be, to be here and to be a part of this, this conversation. I'm going to try to build on what uh, the other speakers have, have talked about. And I'm looking at it from the angle of we, the people of Africa. Not the entrepreneurs, not the uh, donor community, and so on. But the crises sometimes we forget are actually being faced by people on the ground. So let's take a, a little look at that. Some of, this, some of the stuff is repetitive uh, because uh, you know, I had the same feeling with the slides there. <laughs> okay, um, but, but um, let's try to address some of the questions that we've had uh, so far. So I need my pointer to be able to do that. So we'll take a, look, a little reminder. People have talked about it quite a bit. We'll take a little reminder of who we are we're going to talk a little bit about what we possess, not because we want to brag, but because it's the, these possessions are both opportunity and problems for us. What we possess, what we don't, our crises, what we must do as Africans, and what you can do, because I've heard that question quite a bit since yesterday. So it has been mentioned, we cannot be ignored. We, we just simply cannot be ignored. We are the second largest continent on the world, in the world, and the second most populous continent. And we are the one that's growing the fastest. Today, we are 1.1 billion people, increasing very, very quickly. The other thing is that we are the most diverse population on Earth. So it's said that in terms of uh, the diversity of race, the difference between uh, somebody who is Chinese and somebody who is European is actually less than when you take two Africans, depending on where you take them from. Anybody who's been to Ethiopia, for example, uh, can get, I, I, the first time I went there, I was like, what is going on here? They have the blackest of black Africans and the whitest of white Africans, and all of them are Ethiopian. So it's also a very, very diverse continent in terms of people have talked about languages, culture. I won't touch ethnicity because there are a lot of African scholars, a lot of debate about whether we are really so many different ethnic groups or whether we are just a couple of big ethnic groups that have uh, differentiated over, over time. But clearly we are diverse, okay? We are also, as has been said, the youngest continent. 60% of our population is under 25 years old, 60%. Today, we are about 400 million in the workforce, and we are the youngest workforce. So the average working age here in the US and Europe is 50. In Asia, it is 40. In South America, it's 30. In Africa, it is 20. So we are the future of the world when it comes to a workforce, when it comes to people who are able to produce, okay? And this is already, people are giving statistics by 2050 and so on, already by 2020, just four years from now, we will be the world's largest workforce. And contrary to what some people might think, um, while we still have huge challenges, we are making strides in terms of education. So today, we are looking at a population where about over 60% of young women are literate and close to 80% of young men are literate. Okay. And also another point that a couple of people have made. So when you, the image you have of Africa is not this one. 
right? <laughs> um, we are a very quickly urbanizing continent. Um, right now, it's 40% of Africans who live in cities. By 2030, it will be half of Africans. Um, and by 2025, Lagos and Kinshasa will be amongst the largest cities in the world with over 50 million people each. And uh, I think Paul said it. Some, it, it. It's questionable whether Lagos doesn't already have 15 million people uh, living in it. But it's important to note that 70% of the people living in those cities live in slums. Okay. Somebody asked about women yesterday. So, of course, I, I, I put up these pictures of uh, extraordinary African women who inspire me. Uh, Wangari Matai, uh, over there, planting, planting trees, and whom I had the wonderful pleasure to meet before she passed away. Um, the Cameroonian women's soccer team is in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's clapping except the Nigerians. <laughs> because the cup moves between them and us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody asked about social mo movements, women in social movements. Lima Bowie, a Nobel Prize winner from Liberia. Uh, they were instrumental in stopping the war. In, in, in Liberia. This was a social mo movement of women. Uh, the guys had come from the, uh, from the bush. They were guerrillas. And, and we can talk a little bit about security and how when you fail to give people a job, hope for the future, and somebody else comes along, the going rate right now for a soldier in Africa is $50 a month. So you give somebody $50 a month, you give them a gun, which immediately with a gun, my goodness, you can get a lot of things, right? So immediately he has social status, he has power, he has a way of imposing himself upon society, and so you've completely changed his life. So it is not by accident that these groups are able to recruit in our, in our countries. And Lima and uh, the other women, they, 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 they were so enjoying having their guns that they kept the negotiations going forever and ever. And the women came into the hotel, and they sat, decided to occupy the space right outside the doors, and they said, you're not coming out till you sign a peace deal. <laughs> and that is how uh, the peace deal got signed in, in, in Liberia. Um, the, yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, this young woman, Bethlehem, uh, so rebel, so uh, Sangu is shaking his, his head. Fantastic woman entrepreneur, and there are dozens of them. So I love the way that uh, Ifebia showed the books yesterday because we forget sometimes these African, African stories. Please go home and Google African women entrepreneurs and be amazed by the stories that, that you will be able to, uh, to read. Bethlehem makes shoes out of Ethiopia and sells them on the world market. Uh, extremely wealthy women. I also put some very old figures, because somebody said something yesterday about, we are now hearing that the women um, are coming up. Uh, well, not now, please. <laughs> uh, African women have always extraordinarily been in leadership. We have always been present. And like women all over the world, we get written out of the history. But that doesn't mean we weren't there. So, <laughs> so there, there, once again, dozens of them. But this is Queen Zinga of Angola. She spent 50 years fighting the Portuguese. She was a military leader. And she, she waged war against the Portuguese for 50 years. Um, this is Aminao Zaria from Nigeria, um, who, is, who was also an extraordinary uh, military strategist. She, she waged war and created the kingdom of, of Zaria. So you go back 14th century, 15th century, you will find African women who have been leading, who have been in public space, who have been taking responsibility uh, for their own destiny. So this is part of who we are, very important. Okay. And African women have the highest economic activity rate in the world. 
including Europe, the United States, the highest economic activity rate. That is the number of women who are actually in the economy, active in the economy. The problem is that we are at the very bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> That is the problem in Africa. It's not getting women into the economy. They're already there. The problem is actually for them to be able to create wealth. Um, it, it, it's been said we provide most of the agricultural labor on the continent, but most women are employed in the informal sector. Politically, we're not doing too badly. Amongst the top 10 uh, countries with the highest number of women in parliament, the highest in the world, number one in the world, is Rwanda at 63.8%. Senegal moved very beautifully in their, uh, the, the elect election before this last one to 42.7%. South Africa is at 42%. Um, and a lot of African countries, the US is nowhere near this on this list, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think you have 20 women in your Senate out of 100, right? So, um, so, 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 so I think since yesterday, we've been showing you the complexity of Africa. It's complex. So watch out for the simple story. Basically, that's all we're saying. Watch out for the simple story. We possess a lot, but there's always this contrast in Africa. Always. This contrast is what you're seeing. We produce 12% of global energy, including 13% of global oil. But less than 40% of Africans have access to electricity. Less than four out of 10. So I've had some figures since, since this morning, 60%. You, we, we, so with all reservation on the data, we have a tremendous amount of arable land in Africa, which has resulted in land grabbing by US companies, European companies, Chinese companies, Indonesian companies, everybody right now is grabbing our land. And this is a catastrophe because one out of every four Africans is undernourished still today, okay? It has been said, six, seven, eight, we have a lot of the fastest growing economies in the world, but 75% of Africans work outside of the formal sector. In a country like mine, in Cameroon, nine out of every 10 people who work do so in the informal sector, which means they don't have a stable salary, they don't have health insurance, they don't have retirement insurance, they don't have secure working conditions, okay? And we produce a whole lot of all the good stuff that you guys like so much, <laughs> whether it's diamonds or cobalt for your cell phones and magnesium and so on and so forth. Africa is a huge repository for the world's uh, minerals. So just to clarify, because we hear sometimes Africa is so poor. Africa is not poor. Definitely not. It is, however, for the most part, still very poorly run. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> so persistent and consistent bad governance for over 55 years have resulted in Violence. So this is, the, the, the dark spots are conflict right now on our continent, okay? So um, Vemba talked a little bit about Congo, Eastern Congo, which has been going on for years and years. We have uh, Sudan, South Sudan. We have uh, the northern part of Kenya there. We have, uh, you forgot, you said Somalia for failed state, but Central Africa, my brother. Mm. <laughs> Central Africa, okay? In my country, um, my country, Nigeria, Niger, and Chad are all suffering from the attacks of Boko Haram. Since I have been here, since I've been here in Maine, 30 people in my country have died from suicide 
attacks. So Boko Haram is a very real important problem and you go across the Sahel. So we, we, we actually look, look at that. We actually have a violence belt going across Africa now, okay? And um, of course, not to talk about the things that are happening in the North. The, the, Libya is white here and uh, Western Sahara and so on because they don't have the stats at all on, on um, what the situation is, okay? We are also not free due to bad governance. So if we take a Freedom House Index, and you can question indices as much as you like, but um, we lack basic freedoms and rights, okay? This is me and my colleagues demonstrating uh, in, 2000, in 2011, and we are not, we are not free. For doing this, you know, we get, I've gotten water hosed, I've been kidnapped, Members of our party have been put into jail, so we are not we are not free. Um, and then it has been mentioned the lack of very basic services, whether it is healthcare, whether it is edu uh, primary school education, whether it is drinking water for heaven's sakes, drinking water after 55 years of independence, drinking water really this is our conversation. So I think the one thing that we have all agreed upon here as speakers, we have different ways of looking at it and different, different ways, but we're saying one thing, this is not acceptable. End of sentence, it is not acceptable. We have the capacity to do so much better than this, and we cannot continue to allow it to go on. So what must we do? The, 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 the slide I would have loved to put up here, I said it to, to somebody, is, you remember the, during the Clinton campaign, he had that phrase, it's, it's in the economy, stupid? Yeah? So for Africa, it's in the politics, stupid. Yeah? And every African has to understand that. It is in the politics. Until we get the politics right, we will suffer from all of these ills. And we can spend our time saying it's because of colonialism, and then it's because of neocolonialism, and there will always be a reason until we get public leaders in place who have a vision for our countries, who, who are competent, who have the capacity to deliver services. And one of the things that I hear some Africans say, well, this democracy thing, we don't know if it's for Africa. I was gonna use a strong word. Um, <laughs> I have to think of another word. That is not correct, <laughs> okay? <laughs> the first thing is that we have the pillars of democracy in our traditional governance. So inventing our democracy starts from looking at our own history and our own culture within which there are elements of democracy. i just give you a couple of ex examples here. The Igbo, from which my friend Kingsley uh, uh, comes, and the Fangbeti in my own country, they invented direct democracy before the Swiss. Igbos traditionally, they've now evolved because they're imitating Yoruba people and so on, but they had no chiefs. There were no chiefs among the, the, the Fangbeti. It was direct democracy. You needed to make a decision, you got everybody together, you got the men in one group, you got the women in one group, you got the youth in another group, you discussed it and you came to a decision for the community. This is an African tradition. Gender balanced power in the Cameroonian grass fields where I come from, at every level where you have power and you have a man, you have his female counterparts at every single level, from the head of the family, to the head of the neighborhood, to the head of the village. We actually, as African women, we lost a whole lot with colonialism and Christianity because we had reserved areas of power, okay? Um, executive accountability. Amongst the Yoruba and, amongst the, and the, in the Cameroonian grass fields where I come from, traditionally, First of all, power is divided. In, 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 the, in the chieftaincy, when you go to the chieftaincy, the chief is the executive. He's the guy you see. 
But there is a legislative body. We call them kingmakers. They are the ones who decide. Who, 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 the king only executes what has been decided by the legislative body. And there is a judiciary. Many people do not know this, but a lot of African masks come from the traditional judiciary society. They were masked because justice is blind. You see? Not so strange concepts. Yeah? So if we want to invent our own democracy, we must reach into our history and begin to learn about it and begin to ask ourselves, how do we want to build from this for our future? And I tell you, every time that I have been to a village or in a neighborhood and I start from the way the chieftaincy is organized, everybody's like, of course, they understand. But if you tell them about democracy and you know, electoral systems, if you start from there, it does sound like something for it. Okay? So for me, it's part inventing our own democracy starts with starting with our own history. Um, we've been talking, but, and we have the advantage, the only advantage to not being as developed as the rest of the world is that we don't have to make the same mistakes. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. We can, we can skip. We can leapfrog. We can go far ahead. So we can, we can have decentralized government from go. We can use e-government technology. I was listening to Sangu and say, I'm, anyway, I'm bringing you to Cameroon, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK? And, and, and definitely, all we need to use this technology to be able to make governments accountable, to be able to deliver services to our people. This is what we can do. This is what we have the opportunity to do, OK? And for me, the foundation, um, Ali talked about it a little bit, but he talked about it as if it was a bad thing. I think it's a great thing that we are having revolutions in Africa. We need disruption. These systems, we need to break. We need disruption in our mindset. We need disruption in our systems. The most amazing story coming out of Africa last year, and you did not hear about it because the international media did not talk about it, was Burkina Faso. Amazing, amazing. The Burkina Bay got rid of their dictator who had been there for 27 years. Three days after they got rid of him, the army stood up and said, oh, we are in charge now. The people got back out on the streets three days later and said, no, we shall not have an army government. And then a year later, a few days to the election, and, and during that year, they rewrote their constitution, they rewrote their electoral system, they fought, wrote, put in systems against corruption. And then there were a couple of days to election, and some, another army idiot gets up and says, I'm gonna take this thing over because why, why was he gonna take it over? Disruption of the system. He thought they would still be able to get in. And the Burkina Bay had put a law saying, if you are part of that old system, you cannot run in this first election. They didn't ban you for life. They just said, for this first election, we're doing something new, and you can't be a part of it. He got upset, got a gun with a couple of his cronies, and did a coup d'etat. The Burkina Bays got back out on the street. The most amazing picture that I saw was the rest of the Burkina Bay army coming from all corners of the country and converging upon Ouagadougou to save their nation. It was extraordinary. <laughs> and this is what we have to do as Africans. We have to, it is our job, nobody else can do it for us. We must take our destiny into our own hands. It has to come from the bottom up. It has to come from the bottom up. And we must, I stole this from my friend Vembe, uh, here it is. We must reinstate the state. We must have states. There is no way we can function without states. We must have states that deliver services to their citizens. And the amazing thing, the other amazing thing that happened with the Burkina Bay is that they were not fighting for a leader. There was no leader. There was no charismatic person standing out front. They were fighting for a way of life. And they won the fight. 
It was so extraordinary and so inspiring to the rest of us uh, as Africans. So I have to hurry now. <laughs> and how does this come about? So this is my daily job. This is what I do every day when I get up in the morning, is that we have to educate our people because 55 years of dictatorship, the worst thing that it happens, the most destructive thing is not health and access to water and so on, is state of mind. People, our people don't even know that they have rights anymore. So you have to do the grassroots work to educate them. You have to help them. These are Burundian women out on the streets, yeah? Um, the Burkina Bay's one, by the way, because the women came out on the streets the first day. <laughs> um, we have to overcome fear, and fear is real, and it's legitimate. When I go out on the streets, we have, to, we have a meeting and we consider, if people get beaten, what do we do? If people get in jail, we, we get the lawyers ready ahead of time, because we're going to have to pull people out of jail. So it's a very real thing in most of these countries. These guys don't play. Um, the joke that uh, Vemba made when he started, they love that power. The power is sweet, and they want to stay there. My president is 83 years old. He has been there for 34 years. And six weeks ago, he sent out people to call for him to be the next candidate in 2018. So they're not going anywhere unless we kick them out, and we, we are going to kick them out. <laughs> and progressive political action. Now, one of the things that must happen, so just to say that, because uh, people ask me a lot, so are some countries on the right path? I mean, this African story, you know? Um, the, the, the democracy, to me, is the foundation. The political systems is the foundation. And we definitely have countries they are not perfect. You can find something to say about all of those countries, but my goodness, we could talk about America and then we'd be here till tomorrow. But, <laughs> so, 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 but they are on the right path. And here's a whole list of them which are on the right path. But we still have to get citizens involved. I'm not going to talk about economic transformation because I think that um, Sangu has done that very well. Kingsley is going to talk about it from a policy perspective. But you will not get economic transformation until you have political leadership in place that has the vision for it. And is it possible? The answer is yes, absolutely. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it quickly. We can do it better than most of you all have done it, just simply because you did it before. <laughs> okay, so we can learn from everything that you've done. And so our economic um, growth can be environmentally sustainable, and it's going to be powered by technology. Technology can enable us to move forward decades at a time. So very simply, I would say that Africa has an, a, an, a fabulous opportunity, which is going back to the basics of people-centered democracy and being able to grow economically in an environmentally sustainable manner. And for me, oh, I still have stuff you can do. <laughs> Um, I, let me answer this during the question, uh, 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 but for me, you want to hear it? Okay. Do I have permission to, to do that? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is what happens. You get a politician up here talking too long. Okay. So, um, so, so, so what you can do. So this is our fight. No question about it. You cannot fight it for us. But there are things you do and things that you don't do that you know, sometimes make the fight longer or harder for us. First thing is that stop. You, your, your countries do public policy, foreign policy on a short-term, self-serving basis. And it is amazing to me because you do it over and over and over and over again. So right now, for example, in Africa, one of your best friends is Obi Angema. Hmm? You don't know who Obi Angema is. <laughs> Equatorial Guinea, little tiny island off the coast of Cameroon. 
uh, he's the fourth richest country in the world right now. He's got so much oil that doesn't know what to do with it. Meanwhile, at least 50% of his population is living in poverty. He's a dictator. I mean, you think Cam I think you think Cameroon is bad? I would not want to be an opposition leader in equatorial in, in equatorial Guinea. But United States, he's he's your very good friend right now. You want oil? You he's you know friend, friendly friendly, okay? And in a couple of years, it's going to be a catastrophe, and you will have to be there. Then you're saying, what do we do about this mess? But you help to create it. So stop with the short-term self-serving behavior that favors dictators. Um, stop compromising. We need to stop compromising as a world on basic human rights. Yeah? We need to stop compromising as a world. You know, yesterday we were having a, a discussion at, 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 at dinner. We, as a world, we failed Rwanda. We watched the Rwandan genocide happen. But amazingly, we are right now, right this minute, failing Burundi. As we stand, and we're sitting there having a wringing hands conversation. Oh, what do we do about this Kunziza? And we've been doing it. We knew it was going to happen. We watched it happen. And nobody had the political courage to take on these leaders with regard to basic human, human rights. And this is part of what I call perpetuating a double standard for Africa. Um, what you must start doing is what the Camden Conference is doing right now. It is important for Americans to get educated, Americans and Europeans, to get educated about our interdependent reality. There is no peace for you if there's no peace for me. I will eventually end up on your doorstep, OK? There is no economic prosperity for you if there is none for me. We are today in an interdependent world. You must become aware of that. OK, um, I'm going to, 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 to cut through this. So uh, we have tremendous possibility. The, the wonderful thing about having failed so badly up to now is that we have the opportunity for outstanding success. And this opportunity is ours, but it is yours as well. Because we have the opportunity to invent new models, to do things differently. And so for me, as an African woman, I have chosen to stand right at the center of my possibility and your opportunity. <laughs>